is Radio Tokyo, broadcasting to American servicemen in the Pacific. The superiority of the Japanese Imperial Air Force, reliable neutral sources report, is rapidly increasing over the combined air forces of the aggressor nations in the Pacific. The lady, can I interrupt the a minute? The Japanese war machine is producing more and more aircraft to meet the demands of the speed-up in the Japanese pilot training program. With this further superiority in men and equipment, reliable neutral sources what believe neutral sources? that the position of scattered American holding forces in the Pacific has become very great. Lady, I got a different script. The resistance of American airmen fighting unjustly thousands of miles from their loved ones will not be too effective. Their efforts delay only temporarily Japan's program Listen, lady, for quiet. the East Asia. It was further... Quiet, if you army. please. That's better. And so is this. This is the right side of the picture. What the Japanese Empire is trying practically to make up for. A lot of planes and the pilots that went with them don't belong to the Japs anymore. They're not in Tokyo Rose's script, but they're in ours. We're going to tell you a whodunit story without the usual mystery. It's going to be simple, direct, and practical. Right from the start, we're going to identify two sinister characters. Two long-legged roughnecks who have shot up more planes on the ground in the Southwest Pacific than the total shot down by our ACAC, aerial gunners, and fighters. They are the A-20, a jungle-skimming 700-mile ranger. And the B-25, a mean, low-down butcher boy, as any Jap within 850 miles of its base can tell you. Old Snootful here in the A-20 demand a lot of respect. Their story is pretty much the same. But we'll stick to the 25 for a couple of reasons. First, it's more of a modification and maintenance headache. And second, it's a little more versatile in combat. Craft and shipping had to be mastered not from charts only, but as seen by crews on actual missions. This camouflage Jap shipping was sunk because the sharp eyes of a flyer spotted it. But photographs don't answer all your questions. For instance, you'll have trouble getting obliques. The group S2 and his assistants in the squadrons can't plan minimum altitude missions properly without them. Most of your photos for briefing are verticals and too high. You often have to plan the group's approach and the routes of the various squadrons over the target without the full knowledge of terrain obstacles that only obliques supply. With tactics, it's also been trial and error. Mistakes and experiments have been made until now the record is one of continuing success. The combat laboratory is still open in the Far Eastern Air Forces, but not wide open. Certain practices are standard. For instance, on the occasional medium altitude raid, there's always one B-25 in each squadron of A-20s or B-25s that makes the engineering officer happy. It's the lead ship, used less frequently for strafing than the other ships, and therefore requiring less maintenance. It carries a navigator and bombardier, and the pilots and the strafers behind bomb on it. With A-20 outfits, it's rarely, if ever, used for strafing. On barge sweeps, you break up into elements of two or three and fly low, weaving as you go to avoid automatic fire from the shore. One plane at a time is about all the target will accommodate. Even with bigger ships, one plane may be all you can employ economically. But with freighters or transports, several planes can attack abreast or from different angles. And if the ship's not in a well-fortified harbor, a rat race starts and keeps going until ships and shipping facilities are well placed.
But as we've told you, most A-20 and B-25 missions in the Southwest Pacific have been low-altitude strafing bombing runs on airstrips and supply and troop concentrations. Ordinarily, you approach your target over land, about five miles to the side, depending on the best terrain for surprise. You are harder to see over land, and you want to break away over water. For if you are hit, your chances of rescue at sea are better than in the jungle. At the end of the group's approach, you go over by squadrons, each squadron abreast if the target is large enough, at not less than 30 second intervals. This is to protect you from other squadrons strafing and bombing. Each squadron takes a little different heading for security and thorough target coverage. Each squadron also details planes to keep ACAC under fire. That's good planning. But how does it work out? Well, here's a pack of B-25s hugging the water to avoid radar on its way to strike a Jap airdrome. If the weather's bad, you go under it. When you can't get under it, you turn back. You keep a tight formation near Jap concentrations and stay low. If any Zero pilots are aces, they didn't get that way by trying to crawl the back of a 25 formation. The 25 sneak in over the land, each squadron abreast, and by effective surprise, their greatest enemy, ground fire, is caught with its barrels down. Over supply and airplane dispersal areas they go, keeping the Japs' heads down. Behind them, their parafrags for personnel and grounded aircraft are floating down. If it's parafrags, one squadron can give good coverage to an area 4,000 by 1,500 feet. The second squadron may have a different job. It may be buzz bombing, hitting at gun emplacements or heavy installations with ordinary demolition bombs. That means more accurate placing, but not such thorough coverage. squadron is now coming up. It starts its run with more strafing, and later with more parafrags it will give the strip and revetment areas their second going over. Seconds later, the fourth squadron is approaching its share of the target, ready with parademos to polish off personnel and supply areas. split up the target, or which squadron you're in, you're always out over the water on your breakaway, ready to join up with the rest of the boys and get home. And you're taking with you a large part of the answer to who done it in the Southwest Pacific. The B-25, as well as the A-20, just five groups of them, have taken much of the mystery out of Tokyo Rose's soap opera on the Japanese Imperial Air Force. They have done so because a handful of ground crews learned to stretch range while piling on guns, and because air crews learned to squeeze the last drop of tactical advantage out of these modifications. Now the expansion of this whodunit story into the history of the fall of the Japanese Empire awaits the arrival of you boys from Europe. You're going to write a lot of the aerial chapters in that history. <laughs>